exponent laws. So this is going back to grade nine. So this is stuff that you learned in grade nine. Hopefully you learned it in grade nine. If you didn't, that's okay. I'm gonna give you the crash course in it right now. So the product power of laws. So what that is, is if the base is the exact same and we're multiplying the powers, we can go ahead and add the exponents. So if I have three to the exponent two, times by three to the exponent four, I can do a quick rule and I can keep the base of three and I simply just add the exponents together. Super easy. So that's, but it only works, it only only works if the bases are the same. If the bases are different, you can't do it. So this only works when the bases are the same and we're multiplying them. Now the quotient, the quotient power law, um, if we're dividing them and they have the same base, we just subtract the exponents. But it's gotta be the numerator's exponent minus the denominator's exponent. So again, if we have um, six to the power of four divided by six to the power of three, that would leave me with six 4 minus 3, which leaves me with 6 to the exponent 1. Do I need to write the 1? No, I don't. But I'm just going to put it in there so you know that we actually did that math. And the power of a power, that's when we multiply them. So if we have 4 to the exponent 10, and that's all to the exponent 5, those are some big exponents, that's going to be 4 and 10 times 5, so it would be 4 to the exponent 50. I mean, normally we use nice little numbers, but you can use any number that you want. So those are the, power, those are the exponent laws from grade 9. Um, those are going to help you when we do logarithms in grade 12. They're going to help you when we, um, as we do this unit as well. Okay, can you prove it? What does this mean? Four squared to the exponent three. What does that mean? Maybe we'll start here. What does two to the exponent three mean? What does the exponent tell us to do? To multiply the base, right? So this means two times two times two, right? Like we know that, that's what an exponent tells us to do. So this means so if I have four to the exponent two cubed, what that means is four squared times four squared times four squared. You guys would agree with me? And what does four squared mean? 16. Uh, yeah, it could be 16, but let's back it up one more. What did you do before, how did you get 16? four times four. So this would be four times four, because that would be that set, multiplied by this set, which would be four times four, and that set, which is four times four. So how many fours do I have in total there, all being multiplied by themselves? Six. So we would write that as four to the exponent six. Now we could have done that much faster using the product or the power of a power law where I would just multiply these two things together. Pretty straightforward. I'm going to switch colors for a sec. So if we were to do this side of it, this would mean 4 cubed times 4 cubed, right? Because it's 4 cubed squared, so I'm only doing it twice, and each one of these breaks down into 3. One, two, three, and this one would break down into one, two, three. And if we count them again, we should get four to the exponent six. Huh. Repeated multiplication. So you guys know when there's nothing stated in between them, that means to multiply, right? Okay. Just because I changed that to that really quickly. So, just so you guys remember that.
Okay, can I use the exponent laws to deal with this one? No. No, how come? Two different bases. So the answer here is no. Okay, I'm going to show you something, and maybe you'll like it, maybe you won't, and this is just kind of like a big stretch. Can I use exponent laws to deal with that one? I can, you can, but I have to do something first. Divide the 9, divide whoa, the 9. Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Can't divide. Can't divide. You're on the right track, though. Can 9 be written as a base 3 number? Yes. What is it? 3 to the exponent what gives me 9? 2. 2. So we can replace the 9 with a 3 to the exponent 2, and that's to the exponent 2 times by 3 to the exponent 3. Because you guys would agree that 9 is the same thing as 3 to the exponent 2, yes? Right, so now we can use exponent laws. So the product law, or sorry, the power of a power, what do I do with these? Do I add them or do I multiply them? Right here. Do I add them or do I multiply them? I multiply them. Now with this one, do I add them or do I multiply them? Add them, yes. Okay, that was just a for funsies one, okay? Like, that's just taking it to the next level. You will do, if you're in pre-cal, you will do a whole unit. You will do one lesson uh, of the exponential unit on this stuff, creating same bases. Or maybe that's grade 12. No, it's grade 12, everybody. We're going to do it next with my, with my grade 12s. Okay. Let's write these as a single power. And I'm going to challenge you to pay attention to the brackets. What's my base number here? What's my base number? This one. Okay. Oh, look at that. I'm not even looking at that. Okay, three. So what is it as a single power? Am I multiplying them or am I adding them? Definitely keeping the base of three. So what am I doing to my exponents? I'm adding them because I'm using the product of powers law because there's two bases there. The only time we use the power of the power would be if it was one base and two exponents. Okay, so in this situation, we would multiply. Ooh, you guys can't see that word. Multiply. In this situation, we're going to add because we have the two two same bases, but two unique, they're not unique, they're the same. Two different terms? Yeah, that's a better way to say it, two different terms. Okay, let's look at B. This was the one I was excited about. What's the base? Negative four. Okay, so there's two things. There's a negative sign and there's a number. So that means we have to make sure we use brackets when we write that base. Negative 4. And what am I doing to the exponents? Add them. Add them. So it's going to be 13. 13. Oh, but we keep the negative signs since they're basic. Yes, you will. Yeah, true. But it's really important that you write it with brackets, ladies and gentlemen, because this means something totally different. This is negative 1 times by 4 to the exponent 13. But you guys told me that my base was negative 4. So in order to keep my base of negative 4, I have to put that negative 4 in the bracket. That would be considered incorrect if you wrote it like that. Okay, next one. You guys do it. I will shield you from my answer, and we'll see if we get the same thing. It's a division question.
So when I ask you to rate it as a single power, um, I don't want you to evaluate it. Like I don't want you to get the answer. I want you to actually just leave it as that base and exponent. So you're writing it as a single power. Is that what you guys got? Did everybody use brackets? Yes. So I know, do we have to write in the 10 minus 8? No. No. No, if you're good with the rules, you totally can miss that step. You could jump from right from here to here. I'm fine with that. Um, but what I want to do is that our notes are full and complete, so we show like the actual what we're doing there. Yes. Yeah. I got um, I got the negative five squared, but then after that I got a positive five squared. I don't. How'd you get the positive? Since like since negative five. No, nope. because you would you would then be moving on to evaluate, and I don't want you to evaluate. I want you to leave it here. The next step, the only thing we could do was evaluate it, and you'd get an answer of positive 25. So putting a positive 5 squared is incorrect. Okay? You're, when you evaluate, you're correct. You will have a positive, but writing this as a positive 5 isn't true. Okay? Okay, last one. We're going to do it the quick way. We'll do it uh, like Jonah. Jonah, what's my answer here? Keep the base of 2. Uh, 2, base 2, and then like the 6 on top. 5. five. So an exponent of 5. So I'm okay. Like you guys know this is a division question, right? It's the exact same thing as that. I like to write them one over the other um, sometimes. But it's really, if you can see it like this, don't feel like you have to rewrite it. You can actually jump from here to here, if that makes sense to you. How come that 2 isn't in brackets? Because uh, it isn't in brackets in the other one. Uh, it's not in brackets in the 3. Yeah, absolutely right. What's different between this base and that base? Oh. There's that negative sign there, right? So we want to make sure that that negative sign is the exponents being applied to both the 5 and that negative sign in front. So we don't have to put it when there is no negative sign because it's just a positive. There's nothing else in that base. It's just the 2. Okay, that was grade 9. You good with grade 9? Y'all passed grade 9? Oh, we're not done with grade 9. Sorry. Okay, power. Power of a power. So all this is multiplying. So we're going to keep the base of 4, and we're going to multiply 2 times 5, and we're going to have 4 to the exponent 10. What? Oh, I was like, no, it's 4 to the exponent 10. It's not 4 to the exponent 4. Where we are. Okay, the base on this one is negative 3, so it has to be written in those brackets. And we want the exponent outside the brackets. So the exponent is going to be 4 times 3. So negative 3 to the exponent 12. Yeah? Why would like the, the square brackets say? Um, so we do different types of brackets at different levels. Because the round ones were always used, you would be totally correct if you used an extra set of round. It's OK. It just denotes kind of like, this is the inside, this is the outermost. But it doesn't really matter in this case. Yeah? Do we use like the curvy brackets, then the square ones? Um, we don't use fancy brackets uh, to show operation or togetherness. We use fancy brackets when we're doing a list in our domain or when we're doing set notation. They have a different kind of meaning to them. These ones are the mathematical ones that represent operations. And fancy brackets are hard to draw, so let's go with rounds. Yeah, of course. Oh, I'm having a hard time getting the papers apart.
the hardest part. You okay? You okay? Okay. All right. Um, last one. We'll do it quick. We don't have to write that multiplying step. Negative 5 inside the brackets. What's my exponent? 8. I'm perfectly okay if you jump from this step to this step. You do not have to write this step. But again, it's like those trig ratios. The more you write it, the more likely you are to remember it. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump to the next page and we'll go back to that one because I think it's important that you understand this first. I'm going to say it first and then we'll go back and work a little bit with our calculator. So a fractional or rational, whoop, rational, we talked about these the other day. These are numbers. that can be written as fractions. Okay, so rational exponents means we can write them as fractions if we want to. All right, so here's the great thing about this, is that there's almost like there's square roots or cube roots or types of roots hiding inside this, this fraction. So if I give you, um, let's say, 2 to the exponent 2 over 3, so if I give you that, this tells you the type of exponent, and this tells you the type of root. So how would we write that as a radical? What kind of root are we dealing with? What's your root? A, it would be a cube root. So this would be cube root of 2 squared. So the numerator tells you what kind of exponent you're dealing with, and the denominator tells you what kind of root you're dealing with. So a rational exponent turns into a root. All right. Um, so we know the 5 has an invisible number 1 on it, an exponent of 1. We just don't write that in usually. Um, 5 to the exponent 1 third means I'll have a cube root and 5 to the exponent 1. Okay, so I'm going to see how good you are at your perfect cubes and perfect squares. So we're not going to use our calculator. You're good. You'll be fine. All right, what kind of root am I dealing with here? A cubed root, because this tells me what type of root I have. So I'm going to have the cube root of 27 to the exponent 1. What's the cube root of 27? 3. It is 3. Quick math. Quick math. How'd you do that quick math? Um, I was just in lunch break. I was doing... No, was how'd you do the math? Okay, so I memorized all my cubes and stuff. My okay. Cubes and that's like, wrote page after page. 1, 1, 3, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2. So, Rahat took it upon himself to memorize the perfect cubes. So 1 is a perfect cube, 8 is a perfect cube, 27 is a perfect cube, 81. no, 64, 125, right? So if we're doing the cube root of 27, 27 is a perfect cube, we're going to work backwards and the answer is going to be the base, okay? Now, moving on, let's look at the next one. What kind of root are we dealing with? We're dealing with a square root this time. So we have the square root of 0 0.49. 
Okay. So we got to check the place value. It's in the hundredths spot. So if it's in the hundredths spot, we know 100 is square rootable, or it's a nice square root. So it definitely can work. Is 49 a perfect square? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's how we know that the answer is 0 0.7, because it's in the hundredths place value. We know that 49, the square root of 49 is 7. And we just keep that decimal point. So these are all things we can do without a calculator. And the more proficient you get with this stuff, it's kind of like learning your multiplication tables. Yes, you have a calculator that can do it all for you, but the faster you are with your multiples, like factoring's easier. And same with this sort of stuff. Okay, I'm gonna get you guys to do the next one. Write it as a root. Write it as a radical for me. Is 64 a perfect cube? Yes. Is, can I cube root a negative 64? Yes. Yes. Because negative numbers, we can deal with them if they have odd roots, and 3 is odd. So if I slide this back over, 64 lands here. What's my root of 64? My cube root of 64 is going to be 4, but this is a negative, so my answer is going to be negative 4. So you see why having that perfect cube and perfect square chart is good to have close or whether you rewrite it out somewhere, um, you know, you put it on a piece of paper or you rewrite it till you get them. Like I said, if you know the first five perfect cubes, you're laughing. Because um, if you recognize them, it's going to be way easier to simplify radicals. Okay, what kind of root? Square. Square. But notice that the 4 over 9 is in brackets, so that means the whole 4 ninths is under the root sign. So we're square rooting 4 over 9. So the whole 4 over 9 is getting square rooted. You don't like the way I wrote it? You didn't do it like that. You don't like it? Okay, you like, you're like you more of the slanty line. This is... You can see the math easier here. Neither okay, this is correct. And this is correct. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I don't know who you were thinking of. All right. So I recognize right away 4 and 9 are perfect squares. You can write it like this if you prefer, if that makes more sense to you. Um, but this way works fine. Either of these ways work fine too. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of 9 is 3. I would not change that to a decimal. Um, I would leave it like that. Like, Although I know people get a little antsy, and they don't really like fractions, fractions are actually nice to work with, especially when we're in this situation, because that's going to give me a repeating decimal. Right? Yes, sort of, kind of. Okay. All right. Place values. Place value. Do you guys remember them? Yes? No? I think we did this the other day. I feel like we did this the other day when we were talking about it. I'm going to be honest with you. We don't go very far. So that's the tenth spot. What's the two in? The hundredths. Oh, I don't know where I'm going to put that three. The three is in? The thousandths. I notice that they have THs on the end of them. 
I guess that's to distinguish them from the left hand side of the decimal. And this is in the ten thousandth. My tongue always had a seizure in there. I think you mean a seizure. Yeah, seizure, seizure. Yeah. Uh, no. Caesar salad. Oh, no. He was a guy. No. No. Julius Caesar? He was a Roman I don't know. I, I don't, that's a good question. I have no idea who the Caesar salad was named after. Are you Googling it, Chelsea? Yes. Okay, good. Julius Caesar, also a horrible person. Get murdered, so yeah. I mean, his name is Caesar. Yeah, it's Julius Augustus Octavian Caesar. No, not that. Did you talk to you? Caesar Salad. What? What's his name? Caesar. <laughs> okay, sounds like an Italian guy. Okay, the salad guy. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Let's, we're, we're kind of going down a rabbit hole, and although I really enjoy that, we got to get back to these. So, in order to convert a decimal to a fraction, so if you've been given a decimal, you need to convert the decimal to a fraction, but it has to be a reduced fraction. That's really, really important. When you convert from a decimal to a fraction, it has to be in its lowest possible form, or this becomes really cumbersome. All right, so let's look at that 0 0.2. So to convert it, the first thing I do is find the place value. What place value is that one in? Tenths. Oh, except I can't spell tenths. That's, that's a rough day. Um, so what I do is I take this number and I drop the decimal place. So I'm left with 0, 2, but the 0 in front doesn't mean anything. So I'm just going to use a 2. The bottom, your denominator, is going to be the place value that you're in. You're in the tenths place, so it's going to be a denominator of 10. So when you look at that, you're like, oh, it's a tenth root to the exponent 2. But you have to do the reduced fraction. This isn't going to work, so you got to go down to 1 over 5. And if you're not sure how to reduce fractions, you're taking out a common factor. So if this we divide by 2, we have to be able to divide the bottom by the same number. Okay, so this 2 is a common factor. And we've common factored polynomials, so you should be able to do it with just numbers. So that's why the exponent changes to 1 fifth and not 2 over 10. So you have to do the reduced fraction. And now we could write it as a radical. So this would be the fifth root of 32. What's the fifth root of 32? It's one you can do in your head. It's 2. It's just good. Four times two is eight. No, I'm using four. I love it. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to evaluate it with O to calculator. But the first thing I have to do is I got to convert them, those decimals, into fractions. And some of you will be able to do this really quickly, and other people will just take a minute to, to think about it. And it's okay no matter what group you're in. What place value is the five in? The hundredths. Okay, it's in the hundredths. So that means... And maybe you want to do this off to the side. You're more than welcome to. So 25, so we drop that decimal. And I mean, we could put the zero in front, but it doesn't mean anything. And we're going to put it over 100. <sighs> what can you take out? 
Definitely I can take her to 5, but I can take her to 25. You can get to the exact same place, you just have to do it a few more times. One quarter. And that kind of makes sense when you think about it. 25 cents, how many of them do we need to make up a dollar? Four. Four. Okay. So sometimes thinking in money is helpful. So this is going to be 16 to the exponent one quarter. We're going to write that as a radical now. So that's going to be the fourth root of 16. You can do this in your head, I promise. Steve gave us the answer. Two. Two. Okay, the next one. Can you all do that quickly? What's 0.5 Eight. as a fraction? One half, right? 0.5, 50%, one half. So if you know what it is right away, you don't have to show me that it's 5 over 10 and then reduce it to a half. You totally can if you want to. That's in the tenths place. So that would be 5 over 10. We're going to reduce it by taking a common factor of 5 out. So that's going to be one half. So we're going to have 64 to the exponent one half. And if we write that as a radical, square root of 64 is eight. It is perfectly okay if you go from the question right to there. Like you don't have to do all the steps if that doesn't make sense to you. But again, sometimes it takes us a little bit of time to kind of go through. It's important that your notes are good because if you forget, then that's difficult. Okay, now I gotta teach you the exception to the rule. All right. It is. What? Yeah. You use nine? Okay. So this is a repeating number, right? So that means it's three, 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 three after the decimal, right? We got that? So with repeating decimals, these have denominators of nine. Now this one will be in the tenths place, so it will be three over nine. Because this is still in the tenths place, but it's not, it doesn't quite work out evenly. It doesn't terminate, right? These are all nice ones. They terminate, they end. This one keeps repeating, so it's kind of unique. So it's going to be 0 0.3, we're going to change that to 3, and instead of putting it over 10, it's going to go over 9. I have calculators. And if I put that all the time, with repeating decimals. What if it's 0.4? Let's check. Okay, so I'm going to do 3 divided by 9 in my calculator, and I get that repeating 3. So I got to reduce this so I can take out a factor of three for each of them and that's going to be a third. So this will be 64 to the exponent <laughs> one third. So that'll be the cube root of 64. Are you guys okay that I'm not writing in the exponent of one? Is that okay? All right. If you, if you need to see that, then make sure your notes reflect that. What is the cube root of 64? Four. It is four. He's not wrong. Okay, so you asked me. Let's do one better. Let's do 0 0.44 repeating. What place value is that last digit in? The hundredth. So we're going to put it over, not 100. We're going to put it over 99. Okay, so we put that into our handy dandy calculator, 44 divided by 99, and we get the repeating decimal. And so if it was in the hundreds or in the thousands place, we'd put it over 999. Okay, so that's how we deal with the repeating decimal ones. All right, uh, last one. Ooh, this one, this one will be challenging.
Okay. Can you convert that? Yes. Okay, convert it for me. Um, nope. Do it on your page. Everybody wants a shot. D. We're on page 18. Okay. That's all we, step one, convert your decimal into a fraction. Don't look if you don't want to see. You just calculated it? Um, so, I five times five equals twenty-five. Yeah. Times five times five equals twenty-five. One twenty-five. So twenty-five times twenty-five times five. And then twenty-five times twenty-five is six twenty-five. And then six twenty-five multiplied by five, if you do the long <laughs> division, it goes to three one two five. Three one two five. Okay. So Rahat did all the math for us, so we're just gonna ride on his coattails. The fifth root of this is 5. All right, so that's going to be the confidence, knowing where your roots are located um, in that fraction and being able to convert decimals to fractions. So that's what we're going to work on today. And that is it. You guys have a quiz tomorrow, I want to remind you, on 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3. So you got to be able to simplify radicals you got to know number families, and you got to know some perfect squares and perfect cube stuff.